The frameworks we use to do machine learning exert an important influence on the field. ML frameworks in general have been around for quite some time, but recently we've seen consolidation to just a few that pretty much everyone uses. PyTorch is an important player in this ecosystem. If you're an ML researcher or developer, you've likely spent some time with the framework. It seeks to serve a variety of users, from the researchers developing new ML algorithms to the engineers putting ML systems into production. Today's guest, Sumith Chintala, is the creator and lead of PyTorch. His journey to where he is now is a very interesting one and is packed with perspectives on the evolution of ML frameworks and on the field itself. This is the Gradient Podcast. I am your host, Daniel Bashir. If you aren't already subscribed to The Gradient, go ahead and follow us wherever you're listening to this podcast. You can also follow us on Substack, where you'll get notifications whenever we release a new podcast episode, article, or newsletter. But now, without further ado, Sumith Chintala. Sumith, I think that you are probably one of the people who is having the greatest impact on AI today, given your influence on the PyTorch ecosystem. And the question I kind of want to start with, as I always do, is the origin story. How did you get into AI in the first place? It's pretty accidental. I actually wanted to be a VFX artist go into like graphics design, VFX and all that. And and what happened was I did an internship in that direction and then I turned out to be pretty bad at it. And then I kind of, uh, from a young age, I've been programming. I think I learned C, C++ in like sixth grade or something. And I saw this demo from Microsoft in 2008 or so. It's called Photosynth. I actually saw this in a TED Talk. And if you took pictures on a vacation and then gave it to Photosynth, it would stitch all those pictures in 3D, like basically did multi-view registration and stuff. Well, I didn't know all of the terms then, but it was just magical to me that it would match one picture like with another. And I was thinking about it, I was like, how do they compare pixel by pixel And as a, as a naive programmer? So I, I started getting really into it. So like from the computer vision side, I, I started getting interested and I, I started working with a professor in India. And like it, it all kind of rolled up to doing some research at CMU on robo soccer and some other face rack stuff. And eventually I ended up at NYU also, like, I think the the modern AI, which is neural networks and stuff, um, the way I ended up like doing that stuff was also pretty accidental in that I didn't get into any of my first choice colleges and I ended up trying to search for a late application thing. And NYU had a late application and I, I Googled for like, NYU computer vision and I saw Jan LeCun's page and I didn't really know what he was doing doing in terms of like methods but I I, I just applied there uh, got in and I, I went to Jan the fir- like first time I met him and I was like I want to do computer vision with you and he's like do you know what kind of methods I do I do like all these non-traditional methods called neural networks and like I have no clue what you're talking about uh, so he gave me a few papers to read. So I think getting into modern AI, uh, which is like mostly neural networks that were dominated by neural networks, super accidental. I think it was like multiple things that somehow didn't work out and this became like a second choice. And then I I, I just ended up here. It's it's funny how, how accidental a lot of these paths seem to go. I'm... Sort of curious, I guess, so in your in your earlier work, you worked on, I guess, a, a lot of really interesting things. And so 
One of them was the CNN paper with Jan LeCun, where you were applying convolutional neural networks to handwritten digit classification. And I know that there are a lot of kind of earlier computer vision methods that were based off of things like landmarks. And I'm sort of curious just when you were working on this paper, what like the state of computer vision generally looked like in a little bit more detail, the methods that people were using, what some of your challenges were when you were when you were working on this paper? Yeah, so while we were working on this paper, this was still 20... 11 20 it was 2012 uh yeah right. it was 2012 april was when it was published but like late 2011 through 2012 we worked on this back then the landscape of computer vision slash machine learning was you used features you sift hog features like a bunch of these handcrafted features that people spent like years refining and stuff and then you extracted those features and then you sent them into a, an svm like a kernel svm of some sort and that was the state of the art and mostly what people were adjusting and tweaking was the features themselves oh like are you using sift what parameters are you using sift and hog like what about like these other things what about surfills and like various other things and the other thing you tweaked was the the classifier itself, which was like, oh, which SVM are you using? Or are you using an SVM? Are you using an RBF kernel? Or are you using a different kernel for the SVM just you know, to project it up? So uh, primarily exploration was in those knobs. And our paper did connets, which was completely, the, the thesis was, Oh, you don't need to do any of those things. Just do end-to-end learning. Just take pixels and then push it through a neural network. And then you mostly modify the loss, the model architecture, and the pre-processing of the images, which uh, only our lab and the IDCL lab, so it's a Dan Sarasan and like Jürgen Schmidover and those people, they were doing it and Jan Lekun's lab was doing it. I think like the Hinton Benjia labs were not doing pun nets. They were doing like other methods like these um, unsupervised methods and stuff. So yeah, I think that was like pun nets was mainly these two labs and everyone else in the world was doing all these traditional methods that were really popular at that time. It all changed in December 2012. After Alex Kurzeski published his like ImageNet results, people basically within two years. I mean, there was obviously like that that phase of like you don't believe it. You get like you you downplay it. You're like, oh, this is just like a fad or whatever. But there's that healthy phase in the scientific community of like not believing and being extremely skeptical, and then started accepting it and actually one of my friends who was a grad student at that time um the the guy who wrote cafe uh he had to tiptoe around his advisor uh to work on cafe and work on neural networks because his advisor was like not supportive of working on these methods at all so i think there's that like large shift especially on in the younger people who were like this is the future i don't know what like these professors are thinking and within two years everyone changed their mind there there wasn't really much pushback but like yeah and now like today's like all neural networks i don't know if it's something you could call like institutional inertia, but it definitely does feel like a lot of times in science, there is a little bit of holding back by more established academics who maybe they have some set of incentives, but they're just not too welcoming of newer methods. But I guess after after AlexNet and around that time, there was kind of no ability to deny that the methods, I mean, neural nets were really just winning on their own merit at that stage. Yeah, I think there's like a couple of things. One is like a sunk cost fallacy, right? So so if you basically invested 
like 10 years of your life into a certain expertise, you would want to give that a fair shot before you give, give up on it. The other thing is there are genuinely fads that come and go and they last for longer than you think. And like the older, more experienced people do see some of these fads come and go and they want to make sure this new thing isn't really a fad. Like one example, which I worked on <laughs> is GANs. Like GANs like came and went. You know, like if you if you talk to someone in twenty seventeen, they would look at you like a fool if you said GANs were like a passing fad and like because half the papers were being written about GANs, right? I stopped working on GANs at some point because I just thought it they were so unstable and it was not clear that they could be stabilized. Um I, I developed this conviction like over a couple of years, but also this Frank Husar wrote this beautiful blog post around how like GANs are unstable and we need to take a very close look on how to stabilize them before making them realistically mainstream. And I was like, I, I'm not a theoretical mathematician. I It's not my expertise. I also fully agree that GANs are highly unstable and it's not clear how they work, what the dynamics are. So like I shelved my work on GANs purely because I was like, I'll just wait in, for a few years until someone figures this out because I, it's not in my interest to to work on this. But like that's like an example of a fad. So, so I think it's completely fair for people to have that position, but also have other people completely like counter that position and prove them wrong. That's a very good point. And I can imagine that people who have seen more hype cycles, more of these fads probably have slightly, at least slightly, if not much better BS detectors than the rest of us. But it does make you wonder how much anybody really knows what is going to be a fad and what's not, especially when you're working in a field where I think the consequences of lots of things and the potential directions it could go, there are just so many possible paths ahead, I guess. I'd love to hear a little bit about how you got into working on guns in the first place. So this all happened in 2014, December, in Europe. It was my first conference. Uh, first machine learning conference, but also I think my first conference. And I went to Europe, so I saw all the posters. Uh, I just saw Ian Goodfellow's uh, GAN poster, and conceptually, I thought it was really cool. I don't really focus on some kind of principled search of some grand problem or whatever like and in some sense like i'm an i'm a very empirical scientist i ask questions that are very grounded in reality and like that look fairly like an applied question except like to actually get there you probably need to solve a bunch of fundamental problems so i guess like to actually characterize it in a slightly different way there are scientists who are care about answering questions uh, and there's scientists who care about understanding methods. Like there, there's like various like kinds of scientists. Like some of them are married to like the method or the technology. Some of them are married to like the outcome, the the end result. I'm very much of the latter. So I generally just explore like whatever uh, seems cool uh, in terms and promising in terms of methods. So anyway, I saw Ian's uh, poster and I just was like, this is so cool. And I just started working on it. Uh, and in in the lab at that time at FAIR, um, there was a couple of other people working on it. So we joined up and started working on it. And that's how we ended up uh, doing our first paper, LAPGAN. And then DCGAN was really like, the the power of Twitter and Google Plus. Like I I published Lapcan and then I was just exchanging a bunch of tweets and threads and comments like with a bunch of people online. 
one of them was Alec Radford. And I went to Boston at some point just casually for something else for like a talk or something. And I messaged Alex saying, hey, like I'm in Boston, like, do you want to hang out? So we hung out like at some coffee shop and we just kept in touch. And Alec was working on DC GAN at that time. And he basically would ask a bunch of questions uh, like, hey, what experiment should I do? Should I do this? Should I do that? And I would like, Mainly, like, I think my contribution to DCGAN was, like, helping with experiment design and, like, just helping writing the paper, framing things and all of that. Um, and then and then once I got, once I did LabGAN and, like, my name was on a DCGAN paper, like, people started asking me to help in a lot more GAN projects. At that time, GAN, so after DC GAN, GAN's exploded quite a bit. Wasserstein GAN was um, me and my really close friend, uh, Martin Arhovsky. Um Martin was my intern the previous summer, and we worked together in StarCraft. And we, 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 we would chat about a million different things. And Martin is like a proper mathematician. Um, and I like, so he had this cool theory that Wasserstein distances and GANs are related and stuff. And so I helped him out on making that into a concrete work. Like, sure. Like you have your starting point, but like, here's how we prove it out. Here's like how we actually do experiment design and like, and then I actually, I think helped run like a bunch of experiments and actually wrote most of the code. So, um, yeah, that's my journey with GANs and after Wasserstein GANs. And through that journey, I was generally frustrated by how it felt like we were just searching for a needle in a haystack rather than like doing something a bit more principled. And after Wasserstein GAN, I, there's two things that happened. One, I got frustrated with GANs anyways, and the other, I PyTorch also published right at that time and I just got really busy with PyTorch and already being frustrated with GANs I just was like you know what that's it I'm not working on it anymore that's that's totally understandable and of course you had something that was really high leverage to work on outside of that I think this would be a good place to pivot towards now we've discussed a little bit of the ML science portion of the beginning of your journey I'd love to hear about your experience with ML frameworks during that time. So what did the state of ML frameworks look like when you were just getting started doing research? Yeah. Um, when I started, I ML frameworks were, there were no binary installs, like you had to install from source. Um, and the documentation was pretty sketchy. And they were written in all kinds of languages. Like I, when I was getting started, uh, I used an ML framework written in C++. And the next year I used one written in Lua. For my homeworks, I uh, used one written in Lisp. Um, and I, a bunch of people at that time were using Piano, which was written in Python. So it was like a healthy mix of things. And these were like uh, tiny projects, like mostly developed by like a couple of grad students in their free time kind of thing. And then the year after I graduated from mas my master's in uh, Cafe, started being popular. It's also written in C++. And by the time I started working at FAIR, um, I think there were like 15, yeah, yeah, there were 15 machine learning frameworks uh, that were like, it was, an, it was an active battlefield of frameworks that were trying to differentiate themselves with like X or Y or Z. What were some of the ways they were trying to differentiate themselves? And did you find anything among that compelling at all? 
Yeah, so I was a maintainer of one of them, which was Torch, which was written in Lua right. at that time. Differentiating themselves with the same stuff, right? Ease of use, performance, flexibility, accessibility, the size of your ecosystem or slash example slash documentation. The concept of a model zoo just started getting introduced, like started by a cafe. Like, so, like, that was another differentiating factor, which is like, hey, like, do you have pre trained rates for like something state of the art? And I want to like just explain the level of detail here. Uh, in 2014, um, people had their own secretive convolution kernels that they didn't release because they were like the secret sauce that um, that made their research like better or whatever. And so there were labs, like for example, at NYU, there, there was this guy, Sixin Zhang. He wrote these uh, fast convolution kernels that NYU kept for themselves as like, oh, like this is a secret of our lab and we, we yeah. incorporate um, our research with this. So there was a healthy amount of that. So like the point I was trying to make is like the granularity of details here is not the same as what you think of today when you think of machine learning frameworks. People really did a bunch of things at a very low level and, uh, to keep themselves like competitive. Um, the this company Nirvana, um, which eventually got sold to Intel, um, they had this guy Scott Gray, who's now at OpenAI, who was legendary at writing fast gem and convolution kernels that were faster than what any anything Nvidia had ever written, and I think uh, I mean this goes back like at least eight years at this point, but. I believe Nirvana actually like raised a bunch of money purely because Scott Gray wrote those kernels. So um, it was significant IP. Uh, so uh, machine learning frameworks uh, were significantly more low level. The the actual differential between these frameworks and the intellectual property that was considered valuable was fairly low level. And a lot of people were very fairly comfortable with doing that. That is now very consolidated now. Like you just do PyTorch, Jax, TensorFlow. You don't really know or care or understand what's going on at the deeper levels. And you just assume someone somewhere has consolidated and is doing the best job of it. That's really interesting. And that, that makes a lot of sense to me. So I guess what the big difference here, and perhaps this, as you're saying, has had an impact on the the openness of, of methods and possibly science in general and ML, is that back then, the frameworks, they were there, they were lower level, they were doing less work. And so the people who used them, therefore, had to do more, but then also had more leeway to tune them, make them better in certain ways. And so the individual knowledge of like a person or a lab or a company um, combined with the framework becomes a lot more important there. Whereas today, of course, with the relative standardization, everybody is using PyTorch, JAX, TensorFlow, then there is a much more level playing field in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. Like I think in, in the, in most recent, like in the most recent times, like the only work I've seen in probably the last like three or four years uh, that try to add like fundamental value that complements machine learning frameworks like are either um, from uh, TriDAO and team who did the whole flash attention work uh, or from Tim Detmers who like does the bits and bytes library. Um, so I think those are the only two distinctive ones I remember where we're like, from the system side, like deeply into the framework, you you're you're injecting substantial value that that like that is isn't just given out of the box out of the framework. So, as I think you've related, 
you kind of took over the the torch project you were sort of already doing a lot of the maintenance work and then eventually just formally took it over could you tell me a little bit more about that story how this how you got started helping out with torch in the first place and then how that kind of evolved into pytorch yeah so uh when i came to nyu um I was uh, working on this machine learning framework called eblearn. Uh, it was 2010, 2011. And it, this was in C++, heavily templated C++. It would take 15 minutes to compile. It was just like weird. And then I, I saw Torch the next year because uh, one of the authors, Clima Farabay, was visiting the, uh, the lab at NYU. And it was just like, it just felt so much easier to use. It was a scripting thing. It, it didn't have any compile time. It was like so easy and fast to iterate upon. That's how I got into using it. And then I used it for a class project, used it for a few other projects. And and then I started just um, replying to people on the Torch forums. Like if anyone... And if anyone had a question, I would just reply back with the answer because I, I, you know, it's just fun to do. And I joined a company after graduating, um, which did music for machine learning. Uh, sorry, machine learning for music, and it had uh, it did a bunch of things, but I had a lot of freedom and free time while I was working at that company. So I was doing a lot of Torch open source stuff, uh, like answering questions, sending in pull requests to fix various things and stuff. And at that time, uh, as I said, 2012 December, things got really hot. So 2013, 2014, um, the people who were maintaining Torch at that time, the three people, uh, Renan Colobert, Klima Farabay, and Corey, uh, all three of them became extremely important and busy. And the so Corey, for example, is the chief scientist of DeepMind. Um, Klima Farabay sold his company to Twitter in 2014 and eventually went to NVIDIA, became the v- one of the VPs of auto- autonomous driving. And Ronan joined FAIR, like, you know, like extremely pro- prolific researcher. So they just became busy people. Uh, like they became senior, busy, and they're like, dude, I don't have the time to maintain stuff. So I wrote them an email at some point saying, hey, you're taking so long to merge PRs. Like I'm sending all these fixes. Can you please do better? This is not okay. <laughs> and so they actually replied saying, hey, why don't you become a maintainer? You want to like just take over? So that's how I started. Um maintaining torch and once you become a maintainer it's kind of a responsibility you're like really focusing on growing the ecosystem as well so it's not just the code stuff it's like everything like go evangelize it give talks um all of that stuff right and that actually that's how i ended up uh joining fair so fair DeepMind, and twitter were using torch at that time so I interviewed at all three places, and then I joined FAIR. Um, as they didn't really have structured roles, but it, it was the assumption that I will come help build, like, Torch and improve on Torch, but I can also do, like, whatever else I wanted. That sounds like a, a pretty good deal. One thing I'm curious about at this stage is how your own time earlier working on ML research, so you've already mentioned that Torch attracted you because of the ease of use, how quick it was to use. Was there anything else about your time doing ML research that perhaps gave you a vision of what you wanted to see out of an ML framework that you didn't see there already? Yeah, so I think like this wasn't like some kind of prolific vision that I woke up one day and I was like, oh, this is what we need to build. But I think it is pretty safe to say at this stage that I have a reasonably good 
product vision, especially in ML platforms. And I think I got a significant, um, my, like, like a lot of my like getting good at this was because I was deeply helping out people with their problems and I put myself in their shoes routinely. So I think I, I generally, um, the, I would say the 10,000 plus hours that I spent in helping people, like for all the way from like answering questions to, um, spending hours and hours, like just sitting and helping them debug stuff or like, um, if they ask me how something can be done better, spending my own time trying to deeply think and understand how it can be done better. That, that really shaped how I think about these things. And, um, a lot of the, a lot of it, ob- like, may obviously boils down to usability, and usability is hard to measure, but it's basically drilled down to the feeling that you get when you feel an adrenaline adrenaline boost when you get something done on the computer, doing using something like you just like did it, and it's like, oh yeah, like it's working that amazing. Like the fastest time to get there, in my opinion, is like you know, usability. And this can be something from like a micro decision, as saving two clicks to do something that you do every day, all the way to uh, being able to think clearly. Uh, like if you have an idea, there's a bunch of tools you use to actually make that idea a reality. If the tools are more usable you you can execute that idea into reality much more clearly i wouldn't say much more quickly or not like that depends but like you can just keep that idea as a center point of your head instead of like putting that idea through multiple convoluted things that make you lose track of like what you're trying to do in the first place so like usability really like i think Drills, it's a very subjective thing that drills down in multiple ways, but getting out of the way, being efficient, there's all these things. So I think I've developed a sense of that um, eventually helping me build PyTorch. These make sense as really high-level principles. And I think my next question then is how some of these high-level ideas you picked up about usability, what that looked like, what it meant to customers, to people who were using the framework, how that manifested as you were beginning to build PyTorch. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, um, I did a few things. One, I was pretty convinced by that time uh, that you can never get a framework or a product right in the first iteration. Like, it doesn't matter how much of a genius you are. Like, in the first iteration, you only directionally get to where you should be. So when we built PyTorch, we we had a strong feedback cycle that we explicitly set up from the get-go, where every week we would onboard a few of our friends and eventually, like, a few of our friends of friends to use it. And then we would just be available. We would just be like, all right, like, if you see any problem, just ping us. Like if you, you can even call us in our cell or something. So that iteration, I think by the time we actually released PyTorch to the world, we had about a hundred iterations of PyTorch already. So that, that I think significantly changes things. So it's not just for PyTorch. If I build any product, I, that's, just, that's just how I would basically uh, do it again. Uh, the second thing is, I think it's pretty important to be explicit about what are the knobs people care about in your product. Um, people like at some point I wrote down like, okay, like what are the types of innovation that are happening in AI? And there's basically like, if, if you actually like try to sit down and like drill down all the kinds of ways in which things are changing, um, better neural network structures, better optimization like methods, scaling to larger neural networks, defining more clever objective functions, injecting better priors into pre-processing and post-processing, 
collecting better data labels, clever labels, um, various training regimes that are different. Like instead of supervised, you do unsupervised games or semi-supervised things. Uh, using hardware more efficiently, like speed of training, speed of deployment, latency, that kind of stuff. Like these are all the knobs people use to make progress. So when we like when we're building the framework, uh, I looked at very explicitly. Okay, what are the knobs that we should be betting on? Like obviously, like making a framework that allows you to like tune all these knobs all at the same time in a very efficient way is, is not po- like it's not possible or easy and that is just like one of those like paradox of choice kind of thing like, it's just like you need to like pick and choose what you're gonna enable your users more than others so we picked uh this thesis that Modeling innovation, that is architectural innovations are going to continue to be one of the most important things in making, uh, pushing the field forward for the next few years. So we just said, okay, that's, that's what we're going for. So then you have to keep the modeler at the center of your universe. So like, like there's a modeler, there's like the, the backend engineer, there's like a few personas, right? Like if you, if you build a framework, that absolutely optimize for a modeler to be flexible and like do their work most productively. Even, like, and it will come at a cost with making backend engineers like happier. Like, so that's that, that was our thesis. And so we were very explicit when we built the first sketches. So just having that clear thesis of what you're betting on, uh, like I think like if, if the product has to be successful, like you don't, just try to do everything you just bet on some things and you're hoping that your bet also is true and that amplifies like the structural advantage to your product so that's pretty much how like that's the second thing i think i think those are the two main things and as part of the first thing around like feedback and users and stuff apart from like the the initial product iteration thing I had enough experience over like the six years before in supporting users, like answering their questions and like understood. I understood how at a larger scale, like feedback cycles like tend to be. So we very carefully design within PyTorch how people would, if they faced a problem, what, what would happen? So we explicitly design forums which could be Google indexable, like not Google group forms, which are crappy, but like, you know, we use like this new thing. Um, And then we had a very high touch, low volume thing called, uh, which was a PyTorch Slack. And we would only invite people who were not, who who crossed a certain level of competence in PyTorch because like we knew supporting, um, like why chat was very expensive and draining for like everyone involved. So we didn't want people to come in and like put like a giant message and say, oh, I got this error. Like, can someone help me? Like, because that was way better suited for the forums than Slack. Like Slack would be way more productive if we had more meaningful discussions. And then we had the Twitter account where we set up a bunch of monitors. If anyone anywhere mentioned PyTorch on the internet, we would get like a message. And we would amplify the high quality projects. Uh, so that stuff as well, I think it goes into the first bucket I talked about, which we were very explicit about. So, th- so these two things are how we actually operationalized what my like my like usability and you know things like that. That seems to speak not just to usability, but also a bit to community design, if we could call it that. One aspect of the user experience story I'm curious about for you is, as you mentioned, and I think you discussed here and also in a talk that you had sort of three kinds of personas of people you could serve, the modeler, the compiler, the production person. And of course, as you said, you were explicitly focused on the modeler. In describing his principles for Keras and what he prefers in a deep learning framework, Francois Cholet often 
talks about this idea of progressive disclosure of complexity, just that you don't have to force somebody to get into the details, but the more that they want to dive in, you allow that for them in some principled way. I'm curious if in the early stages of building PyTorch, that was explicitly in your mind. Yeah. Um, yeah, this was not just part of PyTorch, but also while we were building Torch. Uh, the way I think about it is like Huffman coding, which is just like how sh- like the most frequent things you write have to be like written with the least amount of bits. Uh, it just like makes it convenient, short, happy. So like in, in PyTorch, like in the API, like it's not just like the the API options that are default are like the the best options, but also literally like the most frequent functions are also like shorter in terms of the, like the string length, um, just because we know that's pretty important. Um, Francois, like I, I read Francois' principles; they're great. Like um, we're, we're on the same page there. Uh, we think a lot about. Um, having really good defaults and um, and exposing complexity in, in a way that is uh, incremental, hierarchical, and um, the way we like think about it is like most people in most scenarios shouldn't care about anything more than the defaults. And then those who care about it should get the absolute power to like tweak it to death. I think we're on the same page there. Your experience with Torch earlier and then your experience with PyTorch over these past two years, as you've mentioned, you had to put a lot of thought into the design of a forum, the design of sort of internal channels, how support was offered. I'm curious if you've taken away just any broad principles that you think about in terms of building a community for something like an, like open source software. More broadly, I think like I think like it's hard to really generalize. Um, I think like very broadly, Stack Overflow like that's one thing. Like there's like a bunch of things that are good. Like Discourse is the forum we use, and Discourse like themselves as a product really think about very broad. Like how does community um, dynamics, engagement dynamics work and how to build the best software to promote certain dynamics and not promote certain dynamics and stuff. I think at a broad level, like those, those are the kinds of things that people are working on and that is awesome. And like, we're basically sitting on some of these, um, efforts. I don't have a lot of thoughts or advice, like at a broad level, because I feel I think like where I do focus on and probably excel at is um, at not at the broad scale. Uh, I, maybe it's not in my interest, like uh, at the broad scale, but like more of like, let's think very carefully at the smaller scale and like design this kind of stuff. PyTorch, of course, exists still in this larger ecosystem of ML frameworks, not as large as it once was, but you still have TensorFlow, you have JAX. How do you think about the role of the different players in this ecosystem right now? And I'm also curious how the the rise of, of different frameworks over the time that you've been working on Torch and on PyTorch influenced your designs, your thoughts for PyTorch itself and who it should serve. So at this point, right, PyTorch and TensorFlow have become large enough that they try to serve everyone. Um, I think at this point, the products are fairly similar. And I don't see like a big difference as such. Like, I think the difference is very much not in the product itself. Like, I think this is where like, and people are oh, what's the difference between PyTorch and TensorFlow, right? Like this is the, one of the most common questions. Um, in isolation of just looking at the products, I don't think there's a lot of difference. Um, especially if you look at it at a very 
high level where you're writing like a slide about like, oh, this, this product has this feature, this product has this other feature. Like you basically come with the same matrix of things. Like both of them have like the same features. I think if you look at it either more granularly or more holistically, uh, t taking other aspects of a product that are not just like the code and features of the product, such as the ecosystem, um, such as how these products are designed from like from a usability perspective. Like usability is not never comes up in like your feature checklist, right? Feature checklist like a measurable, like oh, like it has like quantization or like stuff like that. So I think like in these aspects, uh, I think there's a clear clustering of TensorFlow really like designed for production from the beginning and while like the features of both PyTorch and TensorFlow are parity, the ecosystems do give a fairly different story. Um, like PyTorch is dominatingly used in research and the effects of that are if you're a researcher, you're probably using PyTorch because oh, like all of the stuff that I want to implement as baselines is just available in PyTorch. Like, so like you wouldn't be using TensorFlow because it's that much harder to build out a bunch of things structurally. Like, and I know this as someone who supported Torch, which is written in Lua, and Lua was a language that was written for like microwaves and video games, right? So even something as basic as plotting would be a struggle in Lua, like whereas Python had such fantastic packages. So I think in terms of ecosystems, TensorFlow, I don't think structurally is in a good place for research. And I think the very interesting thing about production is production, in my opinion, doesn't have ecosystem effects in the same way research does. And we've learned this over the years um, where every employee at some company doing production is thinking about their company and their stack and like in, in, a, in a very, um, very specialized way, like, and they're not like, oh, like there's this, there's a serving platform for production. I'm going to use it. So like, so Torch Serve or TensorFlow Serving and stuff. They don't get used in production in a way that you would expect people in research to reuse uh, artifacts uh, of the ecosystem. But I think on the production side, reputationally, TensorFlow is um, obviously dominant because that's how they started as the production framework for Google. I think structurally, there isn't a big case to be made from an ecosystem effects. Uh, there's a third category of people, which are data scientists and people who are uh, just like use PyTorch or TensorFlow, just like they use Scikit-Learn. Like they just use it, like the methods, they don't care like about the subtleties. They use only a few knobs. I think their TensorFlow has dominated over the years. And there's a significant ecosystem effect where... Um, people went through very like TensorFlow offered various trainings and certification and things like that. And people were just trained in those things. So there's a whole layer of people who are like in the data science space who at some point got TensorFlow certified or like their company was using TensorFlow and stuff. So their like ecosystem effects apply and TensorFlow in my opinion does dominate. But there's like these three buckets, I would say, of our researchers, PyTorch like dominates for like like for, for data scientists and stuff, TensorFlow still dominates. And for production, I think it's starting to get very hazy um, where we, we see like stuff in both ways. But if you th think about the core product, I think the core product wise, we obviously still have DNA of like our product in in the product experience itself but like from a feature checklist right i don't think there is a difference before we get into what's next for pytorch you mentioned in a fireside chat 
that Jan LeCun built a lot of frameworks in the 80s and 90s that were foundations for some of the ideas in PyTorch. Could you elaborate a little bit on some ways in which that work influenced PyTorch today and what users might be seeing in it? Yeah, um, the very concept of an n-dimensional array as a programmable object with methods and stuff, it has a long history. Um, I wouldn't say like, you know, Jan Lekun like pioneered it or whatever, like, you know, Mathematica, MATLAB, like, and like all of these did it. There are certain concepts of it that actually Jan Lekun and Leon Butu did pioneer that you actually don't see in any other scientific frameworks. Um, the concept of tensor aliasing slash views um, is actually something that Jan and Leon pioneered through their work on Lush and like the work before. Um, that is like actually like thinking of your ND array as uh, something very close to your logical memory on your system and manipulating it in that way rather than thinking of it as like, I don't know, it's some array, uh, array that is somehow stored. And the the semantics of these are pretty important. Like what happens is, and you see this, like, you know, we tried to, before building PyTorch, we tried to build a an attempt of PyTorch in Julia. Um, and Julia didn't have concrete alias and semantics, which means that you never knew whether you got a copy of your tensor or like a view of your tensor, which means if you, try to modify the copy, you don't know if the original thing got affected or not. And like that was pretty naturally okay for is is okay for both MATLAB users and Julia users. Like that's just a norm normative thing. And there's two problems that arise here. One is when you do gradients, like you know, when you actually do like the backprop, you actually do have to like carefully think about these things. Um, and the other thing is when when you care about memory being a precious resource, which it has been on GPUs, then you also have to care about these things very carefully. So they they definitely pioneered that stuff very early on. There's a bunch of stuff that they pioneered for the machine learning community, but also was invented very parallelly in other communities, such as... Um, their framework could export their entire model into like a C++ code generated module that you could just deploy without any dependency on, on list and stuff. And I think that was also simultaneously invented by like Mat MATLAB, like MathWorks with Simulink, like the whole Mat MATLAB Simulink stuff. Um, they pioneered a bunch of automated automatic differentiation infrastructure in a way that is mainstream today it's like basically like a you put you have a function pointer to like what what produced you and stuff like that and because like automatic differentiation had so many manifestations tape base like um and um it also had so many granularities of manifestations. So even today, if you look at automatic differentiation, there's a bunch of systems that are um, differentiating C programs, like literally like it's scalar differentiation that it reasons about from the get go or like differentiates assembly. And like them, like, like Jan and Leon concretely only differentiating tensor types and like uh, reasoning about those and stuff. And then, they did a bunch of stuff around Hessian tricks. So like the whole diagonal of the Hessian approximation uh, to do second order methods, they absolutely pioneered that stuff and implemented it. And like uh, it was in their landmark 1999 paper um, as a small section, as if it's like casually there. Um, and that ended up becoming parts of Torch and Tiano and like a bunch of other things. Uh, pretty much re-implementing their, their approximations exactly as is. So yeah, they did a bunch of this stuff. I think that's a good summary of what, what they did. There's a really interesting legacy here 
Let's talk a little bit about the future and perhaps starting with PyTorch 2.0. I believe it was the principles document that stated the main goal as bringing compilers to eager mode PyTorch. Yeah. Could you break down perhaps that main goal for somebody to whom that phrase might just totally sound like Greek yeah. and perhaps go into some of the motivations, how PyTorch was working in certain ways, and then how that influenced the development of this. Yeah. Yeah. So like, uh, I'll, I'll try to keep it very simple. So remember how I told you that we bet on modelers and modeling being pretty important. And one of the, one of the central effects of that thesis is eager mode, which means eager mode, by the way, the term was invented by the TensorFlow people. Uh, <laughs> we used to call it imperative mode. Anyways, as an aside, so basically what it means is like when you're doing modeling, you iterate on your program without any without any other constraints. That is, you can write whatever code you want and that code is your model. And you shouldn't really be like, oh, I can't write this code because that's not allowed by my framework. So that's the whole thesis. Like you can write for loops, ifs, whiles, like anything you want. And like, that's our problem. Um, with PyTorch 2.0, one of the central things we absolutely want to nail was to keep that alive, that it's our problem how to compile the program. And um, if we can't compile it or a part of it, we shouldn't. And that shouldn't affect how you, you shouldn't be thinking or caring about it. You shouldn't be like, oh, I can't write this because then it won't get compiled or something. So we basically built 2.0 entirely around partial graphs. And this is something that no one in the machine learning frameworks does. We're like, we'll just like trace the program and the parts that we can compile, we will. And the parts that we can't compile, we will just leave alone. That That is like what compiler writers actually hate. Uh, and that's the trade, like this that like goes back to the trade-offs. Like, we explicitly were like, yeah, it's going to be harder to write the compiler, but we're not optimizing for the compiler people to have an easy life. We're optimizing for the modelers to have an easy life. So anyways, that's the central um, way to explain 2.0, which is you write your programs as is, and it's not your problem on whether stuff gets compiled or not. It's our problem, and we're going to do this without you noticing. As uh, somebody who just moved from a position where I was the ML engineer to another one where I'm now working on the compiler, um, I'm, I'm curious to, to see how this will affect my life when <laughs> I eventually have to deal with a, a PyTorch 2.0 migration. Um, so I'll, I'll, see, uh, I'll see how difficult my life <laughs> becomes. Yeah. Um, I think this would be a good place to just move to some sort of closing perspectives and a place to start with that you say on your personal website a a personal goal of yours right now is building a household robot i I just love to hear a little bit about that that personal project yeah it all it all stems from i i just hate to do household chores basic stuff like just putting dishes in the dishwasher taking them out doing the laundry not even folding clothes or anything literally like just remembering to take clothes put them in the laundry turn it on switch them to the dryer turn it on and i used to do robotics 13 years ago and i stopped because doing physical robots is just hard and annoying and rate limiting it's just like way less productive by by design and i I started this again just because I was like, I don't know, I just feel more hopeful and passionate and I feel like AI has made substantial progress that it feels like a good time to get into robotics. Um, I have a few grounded rules. Like it has to be, it has to be within a profile that supports like being in a household. It has to be roughly a human profile or less. It has to be able to have like a basic payload. Like it it shouldn't be like, oh, I lifted like 200 grams and that's it, right? 
it has to be able to like lift a plate full of food or you know, various things like that. It has to be cheap. You know, I just don't work on things that are like, oh, this is going to be half a million dollars and that's basically useful for nobody, including me. Um, so I think at this stage in AI, we built a bunch of machine learning methods that work without having to have precise robots. I think like the cheap part really can be drilled down by making robots that are not very good, but you can fix in software. Like you can basically say like, oh, like the ML model will like deal with it. And like the basic premise is like you start, uh, like you basically treat like, but that's like the characteristic of the, the, the robotic the research I'm doing. And then like, the basic um, goal is being able to treat the robot like a four-year-old child where you, you, you think of a four-year-old child and you say, hey, I will tell you like detailed instructions like on how to go get me a glass of water from the kitchen and you... Like they're able to do it. Like, you know, like they will like break the sound into multiple steps and they might ask you some follow up questions on the way. Like, where are the glasses again or something like, and then you say, I'll hold it with two hands and like, be careful, like all of that stuff. So, um, the premise is to be able to treat robot like it's imperfect in its motor skills, its uh, language skills, and its visual perception, and still make it useful in the household. And so I used to do a lot of it at FAIR, um, but then I kind of wound it down on that because uh, I had to step back into a lot more on the PyTorch side uh, and I didn't have the bandwidth. Uh, so I am actually now a visitor at NYU, where I um, work with this professor Laurel Pinto and his like cohort of students, about eight or ten of them, and um, we are working on this. Like we're very aligned, Laurel and I are like on the same page. We have the same goals, and um, we have a few papers. Like we had, a, I think, a couple of papers that came out, and we have a few more papers coming out in this direction. With this, with the goal of just focusing on making progress on household robotics, I don't think it's anywhere close to the the field itself is anywhere close to like having any of this become a company and productionize it and ship it. I think that's at least like five to seven years away. We, we just need to make we just have to de risk it a lot more from like a research angle, um, but and eventually maybe it'll be dearest enough from the research side and the technical side that it just needs that last capital push and building out a company and like productizing it. But that's my overall TLDR of what I've been doing in robotics and how I think about it. I'm I'm excited to eventually be able to have one of these in a few <laughs> years. I imagine a lot of people who are listening to this might be users of PyTorch, people who are pretty familiar with it, with the ML ecosystem. And it's really just insane to think about having an impact like that on researchers in the field. And as you mentioned earlier in this conversation, your path to this was rather circuitous. I'm curious, for somebody who sort of knows at this stage that they want to make a career in ML, that they're just really interested in the area. What would you, what would you say to that person just about how to sort of develop themselves early on, how to have a successful career, what that looks like? Yeah. I think like people kind of, uh, yeah, I would put them in broadly like in two buckets. Uh, one is like people really want to have a career in ML, right? Like as in like, they just want to be known as like, oh, like the ML person. So for them, it is pretty obvious that they just have to get really good at 
first using all the tools in ML, and I don't mean like software tools, like I mean all tools, including like software tools, uh, various methods, getting under, getting good at understanding how to train networks. Like, like the software is not going to teach you about a bunch of other aspects, right? So just getting good at, a good grasp of like all the landscape, all the tools, all the methodologies, uh, getting strong at executing, being principled, like taking questions and like being able to answer them like using ML. Just like a practitioner, I would call it. Like it's like being a, like if if you go ask a doctor, like um, they're, they're a practitioner of medical science, right? It's similarly, like so they just get good at like a bunch of the basics and the tooling and like how to diagnose and things like that. It's like similar, like for 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 someone who wants to be the ML person, like that's all, like they, they see themselves as an ML practitioner, and that's how they want to make their career. Just like focus on doing as many hands-on projects as possible. They'll get you the experience in like building out these tools, uh, be, like being able to get good at these tools. And then there is the other kind of people who I would say like are passers-by. Like they basically think ML has huge potential and they want to use it, but like it's not their primary focus. They're applying ML like to do some other large thing, like some other like thing. For for them, like I, I, in my opinion, it's it's mainly um, do a few projects, really applying ML, it's just so that you get a mental model of what ML can and cannot do as of today. Um, and that's really good enough. Like as soon as long as you get that kind of mental model, you kind of it becomes one of the several tools in your Rolodex, and you know when to like take it out and apply it. So yeah, I would say like those are the two things I would say. I really appreciate that. Well, Sumit, this has been a, a really wonderful conversation. I want to thank you first for all the work you've done on PyTorch and supporting the ML community, and second for being so generous with your time and chatting with me today. Yeah, th- and thanks, Daniel, for for hosting me. And I, I've uh, been reading the Gradient for 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 a while. Um, and I actually enjoy it quite a bit. Um, so thanks for like, I, I know like the creators is run by basically like a bunch of people who are volunteering to like make it better and stuff. So thanks to you and everyone else, um, like working on making, you know, making all the content for Gradient. And that is a wrap, my friends. As I mentioned at the start of the episode, you can subscribe to The Gradient on Substack to receive not just this podcast, but also our articles and newsletters directly to your email. You can also visit us at thegradient.pub, where you'll find all of that, as well as more information about The Gradient and how you could even contribute if you're interested. And finally, if you enjoyed this episode, we would really appreciate your feedback. If you'd like to leave a comment or review, we'd love to know how we can make this series more interesting and informative to you. And with all that, I'll leave you until the next episode.